Now, if I'd have had time, I'd have shown you a video to start. I'll just give you one 10 second clip of the video, which just sets the scene. And it's called The Scatlings of Africa by Johnny Clegg and Savunka. And I've used that title, I've, I've just grabbed that title. There's a YouTube link there if you want to go and see the, 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 that video later. But as time is short, we'll move straight on. So during this lecture, we're going to look at the evidence for and against uh, Africa as the site of origin of modern humans. Another caveat I have to say is that working out which of these two lectures, the first one that I gave last week, or this one to give first, is a bit of a quandary. Uh, I think actually the way that evidence has worked out in the last year or so, perhaps I need to move this one to the front and that one to the second. But the two kind of intermesh, these two ideas uh, of uh, out of Africa, recent African origins, and the question of whether archaic humans have contributed to our gene pool. But let's get back to the central narrative. Also, just to get you excited, we will end this lecture like no other lecture with a summary not on a slide, but as in the form of a rap. I won't be doing the rap, but you will get some hip-hop at the end to summarise the lecture, just to get you excited. So if we go back to, to Darwin, Darwin didn't say much about human origins in, in 1859 in The Origin of Species. He was a bit uh, shy at that time of creating uh, problems and controversy. But a few years later, or a decade or so later, in 1871, in The Descent of Man, he speculated that humans had probably originated in Africa. And this was his argument, which is that if you look around the world and look at extinct organisms and their closest relatives, they tend to go together in the same region. And um, he thought that perhaps the extinct apes closest to chimpanzees and gorillas were our ancestors and that they lived in Africa. How many of you in the room here think you have recent African origin, ancestry? Just as again, so a bit of audience participation. <laughs> by, by recent, I mean, say, within the last 30% uh, of humanity's existence. How many of you think you have African ancestry? One there, one there, one there. Okay, well, we'll take a straw poll at the end and see what, if we change our minds. So, Darwin said that, but actually nobody really listened very much. And in the years after Darwin, the focus moved away from Africa. Part of the reason, in those days, I think you can argue that most Europeans, if I upset him, <laughs> he doesn't like hip-hop, obviously. Um, back, back then, just about all Europeans were what we would now call racists. Uh, they held this view that Europeans were the pinnacle of nature and all that kind of rubbish, and it was obvious to them that they couldn't have come from Africa. And that, that racist idea was bolstered by the, the finding of archaic fossil humans outside of Africa. So the first finds were in Asia and in Europe. We mentioned Neanderthals before. There was a primitive human skull found in Heidelberg. There was this, uh, I put an asterisk there, it was Piltdown Man, which actually turned out to be a forgery uh, found in, in, uh, in, in England, in the, near the village of Piltdown. Actually, next year is the centenary of that discovery, and there's going to be a lot of whodunits as to who actually made that forgery. But that, that plus these discoveries in Asia, Java Man and then Peking Man, cast uh, the focus away from Africa to looking at uh, Eurasia as the source of modern humans. And these are, there are some early theories floating around. A guy called uh, Weidenreich in the 1930s said, well, what happened was that Homo erectus, the predecessor species, turned into Homo sapiens everywhere, but populations retained this local kind of racial features. Another alternative view was that actually all those fossils out there, primitive people like Homo erectus and Neanderthals, were irrelevant because it's clear that we humans had been a, a separate, pristine, honourable lineage going back long periods of time into the distant past. And actually all the fossils were just a distraction. And it was this long pre-Sapiens lineage uh, which was just cryptic, separate from all those archaic forms. Again, it's kind of, you know, it, it's a form of chauvinism that we can't possibly be related to those people with those horrible brow ridges and whatever. <laughs> 
Another idea was that there was a pre-Neanderthal ancestor uh, based on some f fossils found in, um, in Israel, uh, well, now called Israel, then called Palestine, um, that there was a pre-Neanderthal ancestor that diverged into modern humans and into Neanderthals. In fact, nowadays we do, if you like, recognize that Africa is the cradle of humanity <coughs> because if we look from a modern perspective, certainly the earliest hominid specimens, the specimens of fossils on the lineage leading to modern humans since we separated from the chimpanzees, they've all been found in Africa. And there's a list of some of the uh, finds and the, ge the genera and so forth there. The earliest Homo erectus fossils are in Africa. But one of the interesting findings is that actually those Homo erectus, shortly after that, we find Homo erectus uh, fossils outside of Africa. So nobody disputes that actually Homo erectus left Africa very early on. And that's sometimes called out of Africa one, the first uh, movement of our ancestors out of Africa. But the, the, the crux of the, the question we're going to discuss today is where did actually our species, Homo sapiens, originate? And how did it come to people the world? Well, if you're going to be a racist, you might as well call yourself with a racist name. This guy, Carlton Kuhn, you can't make these names up. He was an anthropologist who in the 1960s came up with this idea that there were quite separate lineages, again, you know, racial forms, and they all had very long ancestry. Two of them, the Capoid and the Negroid, as he called them, we would now call them the, the Bushmen and, and, and Africans. The, uh, these ancestors, these lineages had a long time in Africa, but the other lineages there, the Australoid, Mongoloid, and Caucasoid, as he called them, uh, had dispersed um, but they had, had arisen within Homo erectus after its dispersal from Africa. Um, and again, this kind of racist nonsense. If Africa was the cradle of mankind, he said, it was only in different kindergarten. Europe and Asia were our principal schools. Another uh, American, Loring Brace, came up with this idea of a Neanderthaloid phase that maybe somewhere along this, these <coughs> roots here, these lineages were turning into uh, a Neanderthal kind of uh, phase and then uh, becoming more modern as time went on. But the idea was that somehow or other, each of these lineages became modern Homo sapiens independently, traveling along different trajectories. Uh, one other final hypothesis before we move to the, to, to the center, central two hypotheses we're going to discover, something called the spectrum hypothesis, which was there was a kind of blending of modern and archaic characteristics in different lineages at, at different times and in different places. It's a bit of an ill-defined kind of hypothesis. But since about the 1970s or so, there have really been two competing theories about the origins of modern humans. Um, and um, we have these two uh, competing theories. Uh, the recent out of Africa, the recent African origin or out of Africa uh, theory, which was that Basically, um, Chris Stringer says that Homo erectus evolved into our species, Homo sapiens, in Africa. And then our species moved out of Africa and replaced all those other kinds of humans that were around the, 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 the planet. Um, and that all modern humans are basically derived from this out of Africa, well, from this African original um, population relatively recently, around 200,000 years ago. Now, it's just worth pointing out here that there's this out of Africa 1 and out of Africa 2, really, because nobody has any dispute about the idea that Homo erectus left Africa, um, and that's the out of Africa 1. This is a, it could be called the out of Africa 2 hypothesis, if you like. An alternative idea was the idea, uh, this uh, put, uh, championed by a guy called Milford Wolpoff, which had said that Homo erectus evolved into modern humans in several different locations throughout the world. And it's similar to those things, I, those theories I mentioned from the earlier part of the 20th century, that basically the continuity of gene flow, everything was kind of moving towards maternity across the whole planet um, in, in, in one go. Um, and therefore there would be continuity between those ancient populations and modern human populations. Um, and this is, uh, I just, this is a picture of uh, Chris Stringer, actually out in Chancellor's Court here, when he came and visited Birmingham a few years ago. 
um, and, and I nabbed one of his slides. This, he basically came across, uh, came up with the idea of this out of Africa hypothesis based on the shapes of skulls, on the cranial shapes. And he said that basically, if you look at archaic humans um, in Africa, they are um, a good ancestor for Neanderthals and for archaic humans in Africa, but basically they, they weren't a direct ancestor of modern humans, that basically modern, all modern humans fitted much better with uh, at this African archaic human um, uh, set of skulls. And so uh, he said that, you know, basically Neanderthals were nothing to do with modern Europeans. They were just a side branch and replaced by this out of Africa population. So it's an interesting hypothesis. How could we actually test it? Um, and you could look at this and say, well, if we look at the fossil record, we look at ge genetic diversity, we look at molecular phylogenetics, we could make predictions about what we'd expect to see and then see what we do see when we actually gather observations uh, from the world out there. So if you take the view of multi-regionalism, well, there's no particular reason why the oldest human fossils should be found in one place or another, they could be found anywhere. Could be found in Asia, could be found in Europe, could be found in Africa. Whereas the recent out of Africa, the recent African origins hypothesis would say, well, that clearly the oldest human fossils would be found in Africa. If you look at the geographical distribution of genetic diversity, the according to multi-regionalism, there should be no particular part of the old world where there is more genetic diversity than anywhere else because Everything's been evolving in parallel and exchanging genes, um, and it could be anywhere if there is any. Whereas um, the recent African origins hypothesis would say that the greatest diversity will be found in Africa. And then what we're going to spend most of this talk talking about, when we look at molecular phylogenetics and we take sequences and we align them and we draw phylogenetic trees, we should be able to look at the, to see that the most recent common ancestor would be found in Africa, uh, according to the recent African origins theory. Whereas, uh, according to the multi-regionalism theory, it could be anywhere. It could be in, in Europe, it could be in Asia, or, or it could be in Africa. So, according to the fossil record, um, it's, it's quite clear that the oldest uh, anatomically modern human fossils are from Africa. So, these uh, fossils from Omo in Ethiopia, around 195,000 years ago. Um, and then the next uh, oldest set of fossils are from Herto in Ethiopia, and about 150 to 160,000 uh, years ago. Um, and any fossils that uh, belong to anatomically modern humans from outside Africa are much younger. Um, and so this fits in with the idea that, that uh, anatomically modern humans originated in Africa um, and then spread around the world. This is a, a, a study looking at um, alloenzyme polymorphism. So it's a bit old-fashioned way of looking at things. But if you look at um, 120 protein genes and you look at the variation in the sequences, of, or particularly the properties of those proteins in terms of the way they run on gels and so forth, you can see that the African group is um, an early branch, a deep branch within the phylogeny of humans. And that, again, is consistent with the idea that, that humans originated in Africa, and that's where, the most, uh, the, where they've had most time to accumulate diversity um, uh, uh, over these 200,000 years. But most of the evidence for this is now coming from uh, molecular phylogenetics. And when we look at human populations, we can uh, look at various um, molecular markers. And two in particular have been very popular, uh, mitochondrial DNA analysis and Y-chromosome analysis. And the reason for that is that these are uh, have a very simple inheritance. So that your mitochondria are inherited from your mother. And she got them from her mother, and so on, all the way back. It's maternally inherited. So that the sperm, uh, although the sperm is actually powered by mitochondria, none of the, the mitochondria associated with the sperm find their way uh, into the fertilized egg. So the only mitochondria come from the mother. Um, and similarly, uh, 
flip side of that is on the, the Y chromosome is passed down the paternal line. So a man will get his Y chromosome uh, from his father, he got it from his father, and so on uh, back through time. And so you end up with these two different uh, views of evolution on the maternal line or the paternal line, depending on which marker you used. Now we can obviously trace this back and look at most recent common ancestors. There are some artefacts here because probably the most recent common ancestors are more recent than those uh, mitochondrial and, and Y chromosome uh, most recent common ancestors. Uh, because there's, there's, if there's a bit of interbreeding between different populations, one person in one village moves every 100 years to the next village and so forth. People have done calculations and suggest that actually the most recent common ancestor of everyone could have been even as short a time as 15,000 years or even less time ago. So when they, they started looking at mitochondrial sequences from humans from around the world, they came up with this idea of mitochondrial Eve, the, the most recent common ancestor of all those mitochondrial genomes are out there. And the first paper uh, that established uh, this concept came in 1987, Can et al., where they, uh, and they didn't do sequencing. This was back in the old days when sequencing was difficult. They, they just chopped up the mitochondrial DNA and then constructed trees based on that. But they came up with this idea that the root of this tree was in Africa about 200,000 years ago. Um, and that this is a quote from their paper, all these mitochondrial DNAs stem from one woman who is postulated to have lived about 200,000 years ago, probably in Africa. So in addition to being called mitochondrial Eve, she's sometimes called African Eve. Now there were some criticisms of that first paper because actually the African samples, the majority of the African samples, were actually from African Americans. Um, and African Americans typically have an admixture of about 20% European ancestry. So it's, it just makes, it makes things a little bit noisy. Uh, and the methodologies weren't ideal. And one of the problems calling a mitochondrial Eve, it's actually a very evocative title, but it kind of it, it doesn't map cleanly onto the biblical narrative in that mitochondrial Eve was not the only female at her, of her time. It just so happens by chance hers is the only lineage that has survived from that time. Uh, and all the other females at that time who had different mitochondrial lineages, those lineages have died out. So this was updated a few years later um, when people started actually sequencing the entire mitochondrial DNA. So I've deleted a few of the slides I used to use here, but just to remind you, the mitochondrion is an organelle found in, in, in almost all of your cells, um, and it's actually a descendant of bacteria. Uh, one could even argue it is a bac an, a very unusual bacterium, and it has its own genome. And sequencing that genome um, allowed us to draw up a, a much more um, comprehensive and, and persuasive phylogenetic tree of human origins here. So here they, they used, uh, quote unquote, real Africans for, uh, among these individuals. Um, and they drew this phylogenetic tree based on these sequence alignments and uh, phylogenetic analyses they did. And the striking thing that you see here is that the African lineages are down here, and the non-African lineages are up there. And the, um, there's a complete separation here of the African and non-African lineages. But the African branches are very deep. So you can see these long, longish branches here to these different African uh, populations. And then all of the stuff outside Africa is really a, a very... That there's not much phylogenetic signal there at all. So sometimes we call this like star-like uh, phylogenies because basically everything's just bursting out of that one point, one, one node there. Um, so this um, is shown, it, it's taken to show that the, the, most, the most recent uh, common ancestor was uh, uh, in Africa. Um, and the, the, their calculations was that this was about 172,000 years ago. Um, and the, the main non-African African branch, this branch here, which includes a few Africans, but most of the non-Africans, 
that was, they said, about 52,000 years old. Um, so this was a, quite a revolutionary idea that, the, that um, all non-Africans actually are uh, descendants of recent um, migrants from Africa into the rest of the old world. Fast forwarding, I put some papers in the uh, Dropbox for you, um, and this is uh, one of the uh, most recent reviews and updates that work. Now there's been many, many studies collecting all of these different so-called haplotypes, or haplogroups, uh, defined by mitochondrial sequences, and the story remains the same effectively. So over here, in this part of the slide here, we have the uh, deep branches that are found exclusively uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. So this yellow part here is all the stuff from sub-Saharan Africa. And you can see these very shallow branches here uh, for all of the stuff that's seen outside of Africa. Um, and so there's only um, these two branches, M and N, that derive from one particular haplogroup, the L3 haplogroup, group, that define all the variation seen in mitochondrial sequences outside of Africa. Y chromosomal data, which is paternal, showing paternal inheritance, um, this is a, a, a used as a, useful as a, as a marker also because it doesn't combine. Most of it doesn't combine with the um, the X chromosome, and so it, it shows its own lineage. Doesn't uh, it gives a, a quite a clean answer in terms of the paternal um, lineages, and we find a similar kind of pattern here, which is that uh, the the non-African lineages um, are nested within a, just one of the African lineages, and there's much more diversity, much deeper branches within Africa than there is elsewhere. And following that kind of slightly fanciful biblical allusion here, people talk about the term Y Adam for the most recent common ancestor of uh, all the current Y chromosomes. And again, he wasn't the only male of his time. Um, and you can imagine that the most recent common ancestor of all human Y chromosomes is, is going to be a moving target because if we went off and killed off uh, the few people that have the, the, the most uh, deeply branching um, Y chromosomes, then suddenly the most recent common ancestor might jump forward by thousands or tens of thousands of years. So it's important that this is not telling us about the ancestors of all humans, the, the, the original humans, the first Homo sapiens. It's just telling us about where was this um, ancestor of the current distribution of lineages. And in that review, it provides another um, phylogenetic tree which effectively shows exactly the same pattern when you look at the Y chromosomal data. So over here, you've got the Africa, sub-Saharan African lineages here, very long branches on them. And over here, all the stuff from out of Africa. So that, in, you know, out of Africa includes East Asia, South Asia, Oceania, Aborigines, Polynesians, Europe, all the Native Americans, all of them are shoehorned into this, just this uh, uh, lineage here, this so-called CR lineage, um, this haplotype. And this um, is just a... a, a graphical view of how those different haplogroups have, have evolved um, from Africa to other parts of the world, kind of showing you how they uh, interact with the geography to some degree. And so the view that is now uh, held uh, as the consensus view is that the recent African origins or the out of Africa hypothesis is uh, true. It is the, um, the, the, held to be the, the way in which humans came to populate the world. Started off here in Africa and then spread out of Africa. This is, when exactly this happened, is a, is some, there's some degree of controversy, and we'll revisit that as we go through the talk. But basically, sometime, 72,000 is a reasonable estimate. Sometime between 50,000 and 120,000 years ago, humans started to, anatomically modern humans started to leave Africa and spread around the rest of the world. 
um, spread out into Oceania, into Australia here, spread into Europe, and spread into, into, um, into Asia. Now, in previous uh, courses, when I used to give more lectures, we used to cover all of these different migration events. Um, and if you're interested, you can just go to the YouTube channel and you can find previous lectures about the peopling of the Americas and, and so forth. Um, the Americas actually is the continent were the last, obviously, to be colonized, and they, that, they came there through um, uh, Siberia and this land bridge called Beringia. Um, but basically, that's how humans came out of, uh, out of Africa. And one of the interesting early observations was that actually it appeared that humans, anatomically modern humans, reached Australia before they reached Europe. It was a bit puzzling. Now, that's slightly revised now. It seems that, that the earliest specimens in Australia were not quite as old as people thought. But nonetheless, people did get to, to, to Australia very quickly. And one attractive idea was that they just basically went beachcombing. They came out of Africa and they just went along the coast and wandered down the coast. And the, the, obviously, because of um, the sea level rises uh, since then, uh, many of these things look like islands now, but in, 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 in times gone by, you could have walked a lot further than you could do today. Now, I'm just going to step back, though, because we've kind of run ahead of ourselves in talking about human um, phylogenetic diversity. Because the... It's within Africa that we find the most diversity. And let's just spend a few minutes thinking a bit more about Africa before we go back to this question of getting out of Africa. So in Africa, it, what one way you can um, look at human ancestry is to look at the languages that people speak. This is a crude way of looking at things because obviously people can adopt a different language. It's not something in their genes. It's something you learn. Um, but if you look at the, the, the distribution of um, African languages and the linguistic groups that go with them, there, it appears to be this predominance of what are sometimes called the Bantu languages here in most of southern Africa and even in cent uh, up to nearly in, uh, encroaching on uh, central Africa. And this Bantu group of individuals appears to have migrated from West Africa uh, down into southern Africa and have um, basically encroached on the, the previous distribution of a group known as the Khoi San. Um, and we'll say more about those in a minute. So here, this is the Khoi San, otherwise uh, known as Bushmen. Um, that was a term that was used um, in the early 20th century, um, sometimes uh, uh, still used today, but generally we tend to call them the San or the Khoi San. And these, um, the term Bushman, I think, is seen to be a rather uh, deprecated term, uh, perhaps insulting term. And these are uh, hunter-gatherers from southern Africa. Um, uh, they live in Namibia uh, and in, in South Africa predominantly. And the interesting thing about them is that they, they are distinctive in their languages. They speak click languages. Uh, where they produce these particular click sounds as part of their uh, a part of their normal language. Now, some of you may have come across these click languages in southern Africa. Uh, some of the Bantu languages actually have now have clicks in, but they, it's thought that they borrowed those from the Khoi San, and the original Bantu language didn't have clicks in. Um, there are other click language groups in East Africa, and there's a lot of debate about whether these individuals are related, and they probably are related and they probably represent a, an earlier population. And I went to South Africa a few years ago and I met uh, one of the Khoi San there uh, at uh, a particular visitor centre and just to play this so you can hear. You can't hear it because I haven't got the microphone on. But you can hear the clips. So he's telling a folk story in, uh, in his native language there. And so you can hear those distinctive clicks. There have been a number of studies done on um, looking at 
the relationship between different populations in Africa, and particularly looking at the relationship between the Khoisan and other groups in Africa. And it appears that this group is uh, the oldest group in terms of the mitochondrial ancestry, the matrilineal uh, ancestry. Um, and if you look at this, um, the map of, uh, of human uh, phylogenetic diversity within uh, the mitochondrial sequences, uh, this is a, r a recent picture showing how it looks. So what I mentioned earlier about out of Africa, if you give the out of Africa people their due respect in terms of phylogenetic diversity and just sample half a dozen of them and shoehorn them here, you get a much better idea of how diverse humanity is within Africa. Um, but it's even more um, interesting that, because basically if you zoom in here, you've got out of Africa here, but you've got these lineages over here that belong to the Khoisan, which are much, much older than anything we see. Um, and this, so we're probably going back 160,000, maybe even 200,000, basically back to the dawn of our species, where this particular branch uh, came off and these um, most ancient lineages were first, uh, uh, first di diverged from the rest of uh, the lineages out there. Now, interestingly, when I was in South Africa in 2010, we got the first genome sequences from uh, Khoisan and Bantu uh, individuals from southern Africa. Um, and what they did was they sequenced these four male individuals here, speaking different languages um, within the Khoisan. Um, and they also sequenced this guy, Desmond Tutu, um, as a representative of Bantu, the Bantu linguistic group. Um, and they looked at their uh, Y chromosomes, um, and they also looked at their um, mitochondrial ancestry. And um, in terms of his uh, ancestry, he appears to have, in terms of his Y chromosome, actually, uh, something that's more closely related to the Khoisan. Um, and when they finished sequencing the genomes, um, they could they came up with this quite remarkable finding. So they compared over here these um, individuals from these two individuals who are Khoisan with um, uh, a Yoruban from uh, Nigeria. And they looked at the number of SNPs, number of variants between them. And the number of variants between these individuals who all belong to the Khoisan was actually comparable to the differences you might see between a Chinese individual and someone from Europe. So that gives you a, a, an idea of how much diversity there is within those uh, populations. Um, living at just a few hundred miles apart, but nonetheless highly divergent. So in terms of 117 megabase pairs of exome, the average distance between the, a pair of Bushmen, yeah. Khoisan, was 1.2 base pairs per kilo base, um, and that's uh, comparable, in fact, it's slightly higher than that average between the European and the Chinese. And interestingly, most of these um, SNPs have accumulated in that lineage since, we, since they diverged from the rest of uh, the, the human lineages. So they're not representing the ancestral state of humans. They have adapted in their own way uh, they've acquired SNPs in their own way as well. And it's clear that there's a gene flow between uh, Bushman and Bantu, shown by uh, Tutu's uh, L0 Bushman-type mitochondrial DNA, but his Bantu-specific Y chromosome uh, markers. In one, uh, um, and also one of the, uh, the Bushman actually had a, a Bantu-specific Y chromosome marker. Now you might say, oh, this is kind of interesting, sort of, but what does it really matter? But interestingly, I was there in South Africa when this was announced. It was at a conference where the person that did the work announced it. And it hit the newspapers in South Africa at the time. Uh, because Desmond Tutu said, well, basically, he has got mixed ancestry. 
He's part Bantu, part Khoisan, and that makes him coloured according to the old designations of the apartheid regime. And just around the same time, members of the ANC government were complaining that there were too many coloured people living in, concentrated in the Cape province, and that's why the Cape province didn't vote for the ANC. Um, and people were saying, you shouldn't be using these terms uh, in, in post-apartheid South Africa. And this was uh, Tutu's way of kind of making a joke of it and saying, well, yeah, basically he was coloured as well, and that there's nothing wrong with being coloured, and that ANC shouldn't be de uh, denigrating coloured people in that way. Um, starting to run out of time a bit, so I'm not going to go into um, uh, too much more of this, but basically this line of work has continued, and uh, we are st starting to, to document this remarkable diversity within these different groups um, and this complex African history uh, that, uh, that humans have. Um, and although the earliest uh, fossil specimens from anatomically modern humans have been found in East Africa, in Ethiopia, if you look at the diversity in genetic terms, uh, it's seems just as likely, if not more likely, that actually perhaps modern humans originated more in a more southerly part of the African continent. Um, and um, this is just ascertainment bias, that we happen to have found those samples in Ethiopia, but they, uh, they're not representative of what was going on then. Uh, and I put this in as a slight whimsy. Um, in fact, the oldest, most divergent um, Y chromosome not being found among uh, Khoisan, but was actually found among an in an individual, an African American, who submitted his um, uh, sample for analysis. I think I think it was on Twenty Three and Me. It was certainly on one of those genotyping services that you can go and say, "Yeah, oh, tell me about my ancestry. Tell me about my genome." Um, and so this is really quite uh, weird that this guy actually had the the, the the oldest, uh, the most divergent Y chromosome um, that's ever been found. Uh, but this is, of course, just the start of things uh, within your lifetime. Uh, currently in the UK, there's a 100,000 human genome project going on. By the time you're my age, there will be millions of human genomes and, and probably hundreds of millions of Y chromosome haplotypes and so haplogroups. And, and, you know, who knows what we'll find, how deep this will go. Okay, so what about getting out of Africa? Well, one of the earliest uh, fanciful ideas was that there was this exodus, African exodus. And, and whenever I think about this, I always think of Bob Marley's song, you know, Exodus, a movement of, of beachcombing people. Obviously, it was in the opposite direction to what Bob Marley was thinking about, was people leaving Ethiopia and going out and peopling the rest of the world. Um, and this is quite a nice idea. Uh, it sort of became a consensus, and you often find this, that things kind of harden into a consensus or dogma quite quickly in science, and people stop treating them as a working hypothesis and just treat them as a fact. And so, um, and in fact, Alice Roberts, uh, in her uh, programme, um, the Incredible Human Journey spends a lot of time talking about this particular possibility of jumping across this gate of grief, as it's called in Arabic. Um, it's only 12 miles across, and that humans walked out of Ethiopia into the Arabian Peninsula and then off around the world. Um, and um, this view that, the, that you could beach comb your way from there on in this southern route out of Africa all the way down to Australia through, uh, yeah, this, this idea has become very popular, this is southern route. More recently though, people have started to say, well, actually we perhaps jumped to conclusions a bit too quickly there, because it may not be that simple. So this is a paper I found, I think it was from last year, where they looked at um, 225 human genome sequences from Ethiopians and Egyptians. And they took the view that um, if humans left by that southerly route and jumped across into Arabia, Ethiopians uh, in Africa, modern Ethiopians, should look most like the common ancestor of all the out-of-Africa people. 
Um, whereas if the alternative hypothesis that actually they marched northward and went through Egypt and then went into the Levant through what is now Israel-Palestine and then uh, went to the rest of the world, um, then you'd expect to see Egyptians showing that kind of thing. And what they said in this paper was actually uh, the Egyptians, the Egyptian populations they sampled showed um, more relationship to the out of Africa original populations than did the Ethiopians. So they're suggesting that it was a northern route. Here's uh, some other papers that have appeared over the years where they basically said that um, if you looked at mitochondrial genomes, you can see these relic populations along that southern route. So from Papua New Guinea, there are these uh, groups from these various island groups. Um, and that these are actually showing evidence for that population uh, movement on the southern route. And here's a paper from one of, uh, includes one of my uh, current colleagues in Warwick, Robin Allaby, where they actually started to pick apart the idea that uh, humans just left Africa, walked out of Africa from Ethiopia into Arabia, and then off they went, beachcombing. And it picks apart, carefully picks apart this assumption um, that had kind of hardened into a dogma. Now, in terms of... Uh, the evidence for the out of Africa hypothesis, what other evidence can we put forward? Well, this guy who now works with me, I recruited him to the University of Work, Mark Uckman, uh, provided an interesting alternative view uh, uh, in terms of providing evidence in that he took this organism Helicobacter pylori, which is an organism that lives in the, in the stomach and causes gastritis and peptic ulcers and, and, and cancer. And it's kind of most of the time, it's passed on from mother to child. It seems to be that you acquire your H. pylori within the family unit, um, and not much evidence that it's spread horizontally between humans in populations. So you could kind of use it as a marker then of um, human phylogenetic relationships and trajectories. Um, and what he found was that the H. pylori in human evolutionary histories were congruent. Um, also that you get this high mutation rate, so that the H. pylori is changing probably more quickly than the human, uh, human genome. And what he found was that there was evidence for this um, African origin because the deepest branches within the H. pylori phylogenies were also in Africa and that Europe and East Asia uh, were much less uh, diverse uh, th uh, than uh, other lineages. This is a very um, lively area, and this is another paper that came out, I think, about just over a year ago, where for the first time uh, we saw a glimpse of an Aboriginal Australian genome. And uh, in this paper they started to say, well, actually, perhaps it wasn't quite so simple as people were thinking, that it wasn't all just one migration, there was perhaps this southern migration that went to Australia, and then a separate other migration that populated the rest of East Asia, um, and that they are, you can start to di separate out those threads. Sequencing Aboriginal genomes has, is actually a very controversial thing, uh, um, and basically any native indigenous genome is, 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 is quite controversial. Here they actually had to go back 100 years. They took a lock of hair denoted by uh, an Aborigine in the early 20th century, and they also sought uh, permission from his relatives uh, to establish this. Because the Aboriginals will say that they actually have never been anywhere else apart from Australia, um, and they didn't want to hear about that. Um, just in, uh, in recent, uh, in the last uh, year or so, we're starting to see perhaps a more nuanced view here, where that we're seeing perhaps multiple dispersals from Africa and a southern route into Asia. So instead of it being a simple you know, one-off exodus, maybe humans came out multiple times. And this is taken from a review that I put into the Dropbox, which is basically looking at um, the relationships of see Khoisan, West Africans, Eurasians, and how that fits in with the fossil record and so forth. Um, and what this is highlighting is a, a problem that's, that's quite a hot topic at the moment. So that what people have done in the past is that they've tried to work out what the mutation rate is in human lineages based on assumptions about when two populations diverge and how much difference they show, kind of trying to anchor these things in time. Um, but then people actually have 
just in the last few years, have actually started sequencing parents and their offspring and actually calculating directly what the mutation rate is in you compared to your parents and them compared to their parents. And it seems that this mutation rate is rather slower, about half the rate. So there's a lot of this debate as to what exactly is the mutation rate that applies phylogenetically. Is it that what happens now is slightly uh, misrepresentative of the whole history, that maybe things have slowed down recently? Or is it that we actually have to recalibrate everything and everything goes back uh, twice as long ago? And if you go back twice as long ago, it means that humans left Africa or over 100,000 years ago. And that is a, an interesting um, supposition because we, the earliest evidence of anatomically modern humans outside of Africa does come from about 100, 120,000 years ago in Palestine, in Israel, Palestine. Um, and um, people have said, oh, well, that was a, uh, a, a dead end. Those individuals that went there, that lineage didn't then go off and populate the rest of the world. That was just an initial failed migration. But if you take the fact that maybe the, the, um, the clock needs resetting, maybe they weren't. Maybe they were part of a, the first wave of, of, of out of Africa migration. So this is still a very lively topic, actually, at the moment as to what it is. Now, I'm getting towards the end now. Um, one of the interesting uh, um, consequences of all this is that the old racist view that you try to put people into races and say there were Africans and Australians and Asians and whatever. You know, and, and even if you look at what police services use, the courts, what in America, you know, what they use as their way of it's it's actually all wrong. Uh, because actually what uh, human phylogeny really looks like is like this. An African progenitor over here the Bushmen over here, uh, other West Africans and people here, other Africans here, and all these just shoehorned into one little lineage over here. And Alice Roberts, actually, when she did do the, the she did the incredible human journey and talked about the peopling of Europe, she produced this skull, this uh, mock-up of the human ancestor, first human uh, in Europe, and obviously he's black, and she upset lots of people in the Mail Online, in the Daily Express, and all that, the idea that Europeans have a recent black ancestry. And that they actually went pale relatively recently in evolutionary time. In fact, it's clear, it's been clear since the 70s that race is actually a social construction. Uh, so much variation occurs within populations, much more than between populations. Um, Richard Dawkins, who's never won to not court controversy if he can, uh, has kind of made the point, he's, you know, back in the day when Colin Powell was in the, in the news, he said, is Colin Powell really a black man? In, in America, he would be considered a black man. But if you look at um, him alongside uh, um, Daniel Arup Moy, who was the president of Kenya at the time, you can see he looks much more like this guy than he looks like that guy in terms... So, it's clear that these, these are all social constructions. Um, and I don't want anyone to go away thinking that, you know, classifying humans according to their ancestry is the right way to do things. Words are far more important than, 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 uh, than genes. Um, and this is Martin Luther King's uh, speech that he gave. Um, actually, um, he has a, uh, a, uh, an African mitochondrial genome, but a... Uh, um, a, a European Y chromosome, um, and I think this is this dream of is far more important. Uh, and the fact that we're all from Africa actually uh, is, in some ways, an ennobling idea. Um, and the you know the, the election of Barack Obama, you know that was uh, the first so-called black president. But in fact, you could argue he's the first Hawaiian president because he came from Hawaii. Um, and uh, this was one of the cartoons when he was first elected, you know, saying that basically he's, you know, at the end here, you know, he's half white. You know. it, 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 all these things, they play out in such stupid ways. Um, anyway, I've just about run out of time. We've got to get the music in quickly. So anatomically modern humans first appeared in Africa. Um, the evidence for that is, is fairly unequivocal now. Um, 
but but it's not quite that simple as they say the truth is fair is, is rarely plain and never simple and the final lecture which you'll get in a couple of weeks time shows that actually we have to uh, take a more nuanced view and that although re the recent African origins theory is 95% correct that interesting 5% uh, is uh, is actually um, you know, pivotal to understanding uh, human ancestry outside of Africa as well. So, as I said, I'm getting a bit maudlin here, but we're all Africans. We're all only 400 mothers away from Africa. If you took all your, your mother and her mother and all that, took the maternal line and made them start queuing outside a university station, none of you would get, none of those lineages would get to the end of the campus before you reach back to Africa. Um, so this is an interesting, uh, I think, uh, idea. And now I'm going to finish up uh, with some rap music. Uh, the, the video for which was filmed just over the road uh, in what was the Centre for Systems Biology, uh, mostly. And to show if you're still awake, you'll have to see if you can recognise my ugly face, which appears some stage in this. Um, now I'll have to take this off as well so you can get the sound. And here we go. Oops, no, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to click on here. Yeah. Africa. I'm an African. I'm an African. Yeah. And I know what's happening. I'm an African. I'm an African. Archaeologists know what's happening. You an African. You an African. Yeah. Do you know what's happening? I'm an African. I'm an African. Archaeologists know what's happening. You know I wasn't born in Ghana, but Africa's my mama. Cause that's where my mama got her mitochondria. You can try to fight if you want it, but it's not gonna change me. Cause it's plain to see. Africans are my people. And if it's not plain to see, then your eyes deceive you. I'm talking primeval. The DNA in my veins tells a story that reasonable people find believable. But it might even blow your transistors. Africa is the home of our most recent common ancestors. Which means human beings are all brothers and sisters. To check the massive evidence of homo erectus and also look at the gasafarensis in the fossil record. And then try to tell me that we're not all connected. The fossil record has gaps with no contradictions. And it complements the evidence in your chromosomes. So I came to let you know about your ancestral home. I'm an African. I'm an African. Yeah. And I know what's happening. I'm an African. I'm an African. Archaeologists know what's happening. You an African. You an African. Yeah. Do you know what's happening? I'm an African. I'm an African. Archaeologists know what's happening. Yeah, it's plain to see. You can't change me, cause I'ma be a homo sapien for life. On, uh, yeah, it's plain to see. You can't change me, cause I'ma be a homo sapien for life. The other end is for the blood in my arm. It runs in my veins. You are my cousin from the same African mom. And the black is for the melanin, which I guess I lost. You came here with benefits that I'll send to cross. The place in the north has a massive radiation. My family passed through some adaptive radiations. We started as Africans, and then became Eurasians. And then one final migration made us Canadians. But it's back to my origins. Cause I understand for every color of man, Africa's a motherland. So I'm coming back as my right of return. I'm only speaking the facts, which I invite you to learn. We came from Africa first, Charles Darwin predicted it. Cause that's where modern chimps and gorillas live. So the green is for the envy of the eyes of intelligent design. Advocates and scientific illiterate. I'm an African, I'm an African, yeah. And I know what's happening. I'm an African, I'm an African. Archaeologists know what's happening. You an African, you an African. But he used them at the end, as you'll see. So Chris Stringer, the architect of the Out of Africa theory in the 1970s, came to Birmingham and we filmed him. Just wait one minute and you'll see him. And, and then you can, you can finish.
So I can't actually fast forward it, but it's almost finished now. If you're interested, just go to rapguide2ethers.co.uk and see all of the uh, other videos in the series. Now watch this. We're coming out of uh, YouTube here, and we're going to select that one there. And here's Chris Stringer. I'm an African. I'm an African, and I know what's happening. That would be perfect. Do it one more time. I'm an African. I'm an African, and I know what's happening. That's it. So we told him not to give up his day job. He's not going to make it as a rapper. All right, that's it. Thank you very much. And happy to take any questions if you have them now. Um, thank you.